Galatians chapter 5 is liberty. And I started out this morning with verse 1. And as I said, I, I do want to backtrack just a little bit. And uh, we're going to kind of, where we ended up this morning is going to be our starting point this evening. But verse 1 says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. And so I started out this morning with the idea that we're to stand fast in our liberty. And I was, what that phrase there means, the best way I can describe it was, don't retreat. Don't retreat from the liberty that's been given unto you. And uh, I use the examples that, you know, there have been battles fought for liberties as a nation. We fought the Revolutionary War and the Civil War and World War I and World War II. There was a great price paid for liberty. And one of the examples I, I, I could use for that is I think back as a remember Vell, Michelle. We had an uncle, and he was Uncle Vell. And Uncle Vell was, how do you say it nicely? He was kind of the crazy uncle. And uh, in the family. And, and he was a very severe alcoholic, had a lot of problems. And uh, <coughs> Vell would do things like going to panic attacks and hiding underneath the kitchen table and, mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And uh, when, when I was young, I thought, boy, you know, that's, that's pretty bizarre. That's kind of strange behavior. And then later on in life, as I began to, I talked to that song, and, and I found a little bit about his history, and suddenly it, I understood that it made sense to me. Uh, Vip actually was with General Patton in World War II, and how he described Patton, I can't actually say in church, uh, but he did not care for General Patton. General Patton was a very ruthless man, I guess, and very hard on his soldiers. It, it drove him to the point that, you know, a lot of them thought that he just drove them to their death at point. And so he did not think well of General Patton. But when I really understood something about Uncle Vep, that he had actually fought some of the most horrendous battles in war that our nation had ever fought, then suddenly maybe his behavior becomes a little more understandable. In other words, he paid a tremendous sacrifice for our liberty. And uh, I, I shared before and used this illustration, I would never want to be the one to look at Uncle Vep and say, boy, we sacrificed those liberties. We gave them up after you paid that price. I can remember that uh, there was a time when uh, I was young again, and probably very young, probably early teens. And uh, there was a gentleman in our neighborhood who, who built model cars, and he was like, by saying no model cars, I mean, they were amazing works of art, what he did with them. I mean, they were just tremendous. And I remember the last time I seen him, that me and a friend of mine went over to his house, and he had these showcases full of models. And he would show us those models. And like I said, I mean, there was something like I had never seen before in my life. The rest of us built model cars, but I mean, he built model cars. I mean, he really, they were works of art when he was done with them. And I remember him showing those to me, and, and the odd thing is, is I never saw him again, because right after that, he left the military and went to Vietnam home. And I've always thought, boy, you know, there was just that contrast between here I am as a little kid, almost at that time, looking at model cars, and he was just the older kid in the neighborhood. The, the next thing I know, he gave his life for, paid the price for liberty. You see, when it says, stand fast, therefore, it's talking about don't give up the liberties that you have in Christ. And to really understand that, we can look at, you know, in the natural, the, the price that people pay for liberty as a nation, and the price that people pay for liberty even within a nation, the tremendous price that is paid. I think, boy, we would never dream of retreating now. We would never dream of giving up those liberties. And it's it just it's important, actually more important, beloved, that in Christ Jesus we understand the liberty that we have in Christ. And we understand that in a way that we can walk that out and stand guard, as he's telling us here, to not allow the liberties that we have in Christ to be taken from us. To not allow the liberties that we have in Christ to be stolen from us. Because as I shared this morning exactly what has taken place in Galatia, if Paul has planted a church, it's doing well, it's thriving, the, the Holy Spirit is moving, and people have come in who are false teachers who are telling them at this point in time, what, what Christ did for you on the cross, the death and burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, is all fine and dandy, but now you've got to obey the law. Or you're not really going to be right with God. In other words, they came along after Jesus and said, now here's the rules. Here's the religion that you 
you've got to do to be right with God. And maybe you and I don't face people coming in, though there are people out there saying you've got to obey the, the Old Testament law. But there are people who would try to give us all kinds of rules of religion that we have to do this to be right with God. And what I shared this morning, I'm going to share a little bit more tonight probably, is a moment that we try to then take our, the moment we take our eyes off of Christ and put them on the rules, we're defeated. Because what we've done is instead of walking in the spirit by faith through Christ and him crucified, we are now trying to do it through the power of the flesh by keeping the rules. So we're immediately defeated at that point in time. You know, like I said, you know, the, the old saying you hear people all the time is, well, I'm going to try harder and do better. As soon as I hear somebody say, I'm going to try harder and do better, I know we're defeated. Because we don't live for God by trying harder and doing better. If we're trying harder, we're trying to do it by our own willpower. If we're trying harder, we're trying to do it by our own strength. Rather than learning how to walk in the Spirit and being motivated by the Holy Spirit through the virtue of Christ and Him crucified. You see, the enemy comes in with lies, don't he? That's how Satan attacks. In the Garden of Eden, when, when God told him that, you know, if you eat the tree of knowledge, you're good and evil, and, and you shall die, and what did the enemy all day do? Come and say, oh, you won't die. It will just make you like a God. And I just immediately brought lies into the situation. That's how the enemy will attack a Christian, primarily through lies and deception. <clears throat> Because our liberty, we understand we have it. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Christ came to set us free and give us liberty. The Bible says where the Spirit of God is, there is liberty. Christ is all about liberty and freedom. He is not about bondage. In any way, shape, or form, to any man-made rules, any man-made religion, Christ came to set the captives free. With me so far. That word liberty, I want to go back and, and, and kind of go over the definition of that again because that's so important. Liberty means freedom. Taken from a word meaning unrestrained, not a slave, free to go to your pleasure. With freedom did Christ set us free. The combination of the noun and the verb stresses the completeness of the act done once and for all. Not to bring us into another form of bondage, but to make us free from bondage. Christ came to set us free from bondage. Free to serve the Lord in all ways that are consistent with His word, will, and holiness. Jesus Christ came with a mission to set you free so you could serve Him. As we get into Galatians chapter 5, as I was saying earlier this morning, we're going to find out that Christ came to set us free so we can love Him. Christ came to set us free so we can love one another. Christ came to set us free so we can serve God without any hindrance or anything hindered, holding us back in any way, shape, or form. <laughs> Jesus came to bring liberty. Now we've got to understand, though, how to walk in that liberty. You can't walk in that liberty by trying hard to do it better. Well, then what am I supposed to do? You can't walk in liberty by finding a new set of rules. There used to be this gentleman that I knew him back when I was in Faith of Love, Love the Prison Ministry, and he kind of, we had different individuals that would recycle. And what I mean recycle, they'd come in for a while and, and do okay, and then they'd stumble, and they'd come back and want to come back in and stumble and, and, and do that. And, you know, we had some that really became old friends recycling. And we went them back in numerous times because we understood that, you know, there was a sincere desire in them. They were really wanting in their heart to do better and to get it right. But they just seemed to not be able to get it right. And uh, one in particular would come and he'd come sit in my office and he always had a plan. This is what I'm going to do different. I know what went wrong last time. i got to do this, 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 and this. And he'd come in, he'd fall. He'd come back and say, I, he'd sit in my office, I could just picture me this day, sitting across from my desk, saying, I've got a plan this time. I know what I did wrong last time. I've got to do this, 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 and this. And he'd fall. And we went through that. I don't know how many times.
times we went through that. And it never worked for him. Because he was always trying to do it in the power of his own flesh and abilities. And I never could get that across to him. I never could, as far as I know, get across to him to where he would really have that moment where he had that aha moment with the Lord and get that revelation and understood it's not his ability that does it. It's not his human resources or his human strength that does it. You and I cannot, by the power of our flesh, or our own abilities, live for God. We can't do that. Hallelujah. We have to do it by the power of the Holy Spirit. And if we don't know how to tap into that, then we don't know how to walk in the liberty that Christ has given to us. Amen? Amen. I used to have people challenge me on that. I remember back in the day when I do a lot of evangelistic type of work and, and go to a lot of places and, and preach, you know, salvation type of messages. And, and that was one of the points I made to them is you can't live for God. I think we would want to debate that sometimes. Like, That's fine. I'll see you next week. Go away without sinning. Check in next week. Nobody ever checked in. Nobody ever came back seven days later and said, yeah, Pastor, I did it. I lived perfect all week long. Never had a bad thought. It doesn't work that way. But we've got to understand liberty. Now, Go to Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1. I got to backtrack for those who were here this morning. I've done a couple of scriptures because this is where we're going to catapult from for how we do this. Isaiah 61, verse 1. Because this is really key. <laughs> so if you were here, don't let me bore you. Isaiah 61, verse 1. Says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the, the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives. And the opening of prison to them that are bound. Notice that Jesus says there that he came to proclaim liberty to the captives. Those of you here this morning know where I'm going. <laughs> to proclaim liberty to the captives. Now Luke chapter 4 verse 18. We're going to bounce you through several scriptures this evening. Do some teaching. Luke chapter 4, verse 18. And help us understand better how to live the Christian life. Luke chapter 4, verse 18 says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives. Now, I just read something there. It says that if Jesus proclaimed liberty to the captives. It says in Luke 4, 18 that he came to preach deliverance to the captives. So he proclaimed it and he preached it. But it doesn't say there that he did it. Now we can read right over those verses and sometimes we read over scripture sometimes and we don't stop and consider what we just read. But it says there that he proclaimed liberty to the captives and he preached liberty to the captives but it does not say at that point in time that he set the captives free. And I guess here this morning, you hear that preached that way all the time. But it doesn't say he did that. And that's a, for what I'm going to show you tonight, that's of great importance that we understand. He preached deliverance. He proclaimed deliverance. But it doesn't say anything there that he did it. Now we do know that Christ did do it, don't we? Christ did set the captives free. We say, well, when did he set the captives free then? And why is he just preaching it? And why is he just proclaiming it? You see, as we understand this, we're going to understand better how to walk with God and live the Christian life. This is one of the key points to understanding something here. Go to Colossians chapter 2. Hallelujah. Zooming through these. Colossians chapter 2, verse 14 and 15. And this is basic stuff, but boy, it's stuff that I have to go back and refresh myself on, not because I forget it, but just to keep me focused. Just to keep me focused. I'm not sure. It, it, it's kind of like an a NBA basketball team. You know, they call timeout. Well, what are they talking about? You know, the coach calls these NBA players over there. They have this hub when they're talking about stuff. What are they talking about? He's not telling them anything new, is he? 
They say, okay, focus on this. This is the plan. We practice it a thousand times. Here's what we got to focus on. And then bringing their attention to something they already know. It's just like they go out here and, you know, LeBron James goes out and he begins to train for next season. He's going to do what? He's going to go out and practice free throws. Now, how many gazillion free throws has he done since he was probably about three or four years old? And he'll have a coach tell him how to do it. Why? Because they're just refocusing on something they already know. Because it's easy for you and I to get our minds and our thinking off of something else that is so very simple. And that's why when Paul went into the church of Corinth, he preached to him. He said, the got church to know nothing among you but Christ and him crucified. In other words, we're going to focus on this one basic fundamental truth. We're going to refocus. And that's why I have to go back and I have to get in the Word. I have to look at these basic things that maybe I, I've known for years. I've preached it. I've taught it for years. But I still got to go back and refocus it because one of the things the enemy likes to do, as I shared this morning, is to get our minds off of Christ and onto something else. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what's happening here in Galatia. These false teachers have come in, getting their minds off of Christ and on the law. Mm -hmm. Off of Christ and and on the rules. And once they get their mind off of Christ and on the rules, then now they're stuck trying to do it by their own power. Because the Bible says if you try to keep one thing the law, then you've got to keep all the law. You want to live under the law, you're under the law. And the law never did work very well. Amen? Amen. Back to Colossians chapter 2. That was a parenthesis. Verses 14 and 15. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. So we know that he brought this victory at the cross. At the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the captives were set free. The captives were delivered. When he was talking about there, he's proclaiming it and he's preaching it. When he went to the cross and he died on the cross and he was buried and he was resurrected, you and I were liberated and set free from Satan, his kingdom, and the power of sin in our lives. Amen. Hallelujah. That's good news. Amen? Amen. Go to Isaiah chapter 53. Yeah. After this, we're catapulting from here, and this is where we basically stop this morning. Isaiah chapter 53, and Isaiah chapter 53 is a chapter that deals with what Christ did on the cross. And it, it talks about how he took our sin, he took our iniquities, he took our sickness, he took our disease, and the things that he paid the price for us to be delivered from. The paid the price for us to be set free from. You see, the, what he's proclaiming and what he was preaching was what he's going to do on the cross. He was anointed to proclaim what he's about to do. And then after he did that, then the church was anointed to proclaim what he had done. But our deliverance, our liberty was by Christ and him crucified. Stand fast in that. Don't try to add to that. Don't try to take away from that. Don't try to think you've got to obey ten rules. Don't try to think you've got to have some kind of religious format. The Christ set the captives free by his death and burial and resurrection. And all you and I need to do is understand how we walk in that liberty. Because the price has already been paid. Isaiah 53. And just without going over all the verses, I'm going to drop down to verse 7. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Again, talking about him on the cross. Yet he opened not his mouth. He was brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before her shears is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. He was oppressed. That word oppressed there. To drive like an animal. To tax, to harass, to tyrannize to distress, to oppress, and to be a taskmaster. That sounds like a captive. That sounds like somebody who needs to be set free. That sounds like
like somebody who needs some liberty. That person who is oppressed, Christ paid the price for them to be set free. That person who is oppressed, Jesus Christ paid the price for that captive to be loose. So Jesus is preaching and proclaiming the setting free or the liberating of the captives. So how do you and I then walk in that liberty? It's one of the most important things that a Christian can learn. Because I can take you and give you all kinds of great theological explanations of how we walk in that. I mean, I can take you and get out the big fat theology books and, and tell you how they've come up with all these tremendous ideas, how we walk in liberty. But I propose tonight that we simply look at the scriptures and see what does the word of God say, how we walk in liberty. It's telling us to stand fast, therefore, in liberty. And the book of Galatians is teaching us how to walk in liberty and teaching us what to look for and how to stand guard because of the enemies coming in and trying to get people to do it by rules and laws. Go to Galatians chapter 3. So there it's going to bounce you around a lot. Actually, Paul, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, asked the questions that I'm asking. And he proposes that to the Galatians. He's telling them, oh foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you? Who has came into your setting there? I've taught you all of this stuff. I laid the groundwork. I laid the foundation. And now he says, who has come in there and who has bewitched you? That you would no longer obey the truth. And it goes on in verse 1, before whose eyes Jesus Christ has been evidently set forth, crucified among you. Now it's interesting, and years ago I, I studied that verse, and, and the Greek wording there is basically telling us that when Paul was in there preaching Christ and him crucified, that, they, that it was so vivid to them by the virtue of the work of the Holy Spirit that it was almost like it took place right before their very eyes. I mean, they could see it that plainly. They could see it that clearly in the Spirit as if Christ right before them was being crucified. That truth was preached to them and taught to them so plainly and so powerfully. And now Paul is saying, what in the world has happened to you? Who has bewitched you and come to you and got you to change your eyes off of Christ and Him crucified and where you're trying to now do it by your own willpower and your own flesh? <laughs> What has happened? And then he goes on and begins to have this debate with them, so to speak, and ask them a few simple questions. And notice here in verse 2. This only would I learn of you. Receive ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Now, that's a pretty penetrating question to a lot of people's lives. Because, beloved, you know, there's a lot of people who will tell you that you have to, you know, if you're going to receive the, the Spirit for anything, you're going to have to keep all the rules. You're going to have to obey all the laws. You're going to have to do really good and earn it. I mean, if you do really good for two weeks, I mean, if you just walk uprightly, and, I mean, you know, you know, you, you don't look at the things of this world in any way, shape, or form, in two weeks, maybe God's going to drop a little bit of Holy Spirit on your life. <laughs> And I guarantee you no person has ever received a touch from God by being good. Nobody's ever received a touch from God by keeping the law. That's not how it happens. I remember reading a story from a gentleman a while back, and I've actually read it several times before. This is going back several years before in the early days of Pentecost and he was talking about how he was praying for people to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And he was praying for a particular individual. And, and, and that person just received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. was just, you know, really gloriously touched by God. And then things had kind of settled down. And, you know, one of the church deacons walked by and said, If you take that jewelry off, God will touch you. The preacher I'm talking about said, Well, he did that a long time. But he's baptized in the Holy Ghost filled with the Holy Spirit. But there's, all, there's, all, there's been a lot of thinking like that over the years. Boy, if you dress right, God will anoint you. If you wear the right jewelry and not the right jewelry and have the right length of hair and break it down, I mean, God bless it. I'm not making fun of people, but that's where that's wrong. They're thinking by doing certain behaviors, they're going to receive. 
receive the Spirit. Hallelujah. And that's not how it works. Amen? Amen. Look at verses 13 and 14 in Galatians chapter 3. I, I don't have to give you my answer unless you read what the Bible says. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law. Being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. That the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit. How? Through faith. So he answers the question there. How did it happen? By the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? How is a person born again? Were you born again by keeping the law? Did somebody give you ten, lip, ten rules to keep it? You thought, well, if I keep these for 30 days, I'm saved. No, that's not how it worked, was it? You were born again by simply placing your faith in the works of Jesus Christ, in the death, there on the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and as a result of that, you're born again. At that point in time, I tell people all the time, you, need, you know everything you need to know to ever receive anything from God. It never changes. But this, okay, I'm born again now. Now I've got to keep the law. Now I've got to be really religious. It doesn't work that way. I have an illustration I like to use for this. If, this, if you've heard it, bear with me. If you've heard it enough, it gets on your nerves, then you get to come up and preach it. Amen? Amen. So I always ask these stories, how many of you heard this story? I said, well, I haven't, you get to preach it. Do you remember it? I always ask the question, when was I saved? The people look at me like, you're looking at me, and I'm like, what's he talking about? Well, there's three biblical answers I can give you for when I was saved and the end. I can tell you that I was saved before this world was created. Because the Bible says that Jesus was slain before the foundation of the world. So in the mind of the Father, he looked down through the ages. He knew that Jesus was going to die, be buried, resurrected. He could look down the pipeline a little bit farther. With his foreknowledge, he knew that one day I was going to come to Christ. I can give you a theological answer saying that I was saved 2,000 years ago, or exactly how many years ago it was, when Christ paid the price for being on the cross. And I'm going to be theologically correct. And we have the song, when he was on the cross, I was on his mind. Well, you know, that's, that's accurate. When he was crying, my God, my God, my house thou forsaken me, like I tell people all the time, that stirs me because I know the answer, because my sins were blind. But then I can say, well, I was saved when I was 25 years old. Because at that point in time, one day, I put my faith in Jesus Christ. I was born again. At the time that I put my faith in Christ and Him crucified, at that point in time, the Holy Spirit came to do a work on the inside of me, and He came to live on the inside of me. So even though Jesus was slain before the foundation of the earth, even though He died 2,000 years ago, when that became active in my life, was the time that I placed my faith in Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And that never changes. How you see the Holy Spirit work in your life is by placing faith in Christ and Him crucified. How you walk for God and walk in the liberty that Christ has given to us is by placing our faith in Christ and Him crucified and the Holy Spirit doing a work on the inside of us that empowers us to live the Christian life. It has nothing to do with rules and laws. It has to do with the Holy Spirit who lives on the inside of you. And walking in the Spirit. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Through faith. And we can find that all through the scriptures. Look at verse 5 now. We're back to Galatians chapter 3. It's not from our remember, remember where I was. Verse 5. He therefore that ministers to you the Spirit and worketh miracles among you. Does he it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? So Paul has just asked the question, how do you receive the Holy Spirit? And then he answered that. And now he goes on and says, okay, he who works miracles among you, how did that happen? Did that happen because you kept the law? Or did that happen because of the hearing of faith? Again, there's a lot of folks, and probably all of us here sometime may have fallen prey to that, where we're 
trying to earn a miracle. Well, if I'm just really super religious, we may not use those words, but in our thinking sometimes, if I'm really religious for a month, God will move in this situation. That's not how it works, is it? No. Do you remember all the super religious Pharisees that were there when Jesus was walking upon the earth? Did you notice Jesus did perform the miracles in their life. They were really religious people. And he's drawing the Galatians' attention to that. How did it happen? Well, if you want to look at somebody who's doing miracles in their midst, there can be no greater example, could there, than Jesus. I mean, nobody ever walked this earth and did miracles better than Jesus. You know, I've taught you many times. That there's something Jesus always did. Almost always. I can't say always. Nearly every miracle that Jesus did. The bulk of them. He brought our attention to something. And, and I used to read that and wonder why. And one day, as I was staying in the book of Galatians, it became really obvious to me out of this verse. Jesus, after he performed miracles, normally stopped and taught us the answer to that verse. Remember the lady with the issue of blood that everybody preaches about all the time? She heard about Jesus and she went down and she fought her way through the crowd and she reached out and touched the hem of his garment. She had the issue of blood for 12 years, spent all of her money, all the doctors, and only grew worse. But the moment she touched the hem of his garment, healing virtue went out of Jesus, ran through her and made her whole on the spot. Jesus stopped. And she kind of got nervous, it sounds like. Jesus said, Woman, thy faith has made you whole. Now, why did Jesus stop and bring his, everybody's attention to the fact that faith had made her whole? And then why did the Holy Spirit record that in the Word of God? Because it's the answer to verse 5 that I just brought up. He that worketh miracles among you, he didn't leave it. It's a question. We don't have to say, Why did Jesus heal that lady? Is it just the sovereign move of God that he does every thousand years? Is it because she was holier than everybody else? Is it because she was the Pharisee of Pharisees? Exactly why did Jesus heal that lady? We don't have to speculate. He told this woman, thy faith has made you whole. So there's the answer. There was a centurion who came to Jesus and asked Jesus to heal his servant. He says, well, sure, I'll do that. Let me come with you. And he's, no, 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 no. I'm not worthy for you to come to my house. So apparently he wasn't super holy. It wasn't there on the basis of obeying the law. He said, but I'm a man over many and I, I, I speak and, and, and they obey me and they do what I tell them. I say, you come here and you go there and they do all that. He says, I understand authority so Jesus, you can speak and they'll be healed. And it says that his servant was healed that very hour. But again, Jesus stopped and brought their attention to something. As thou hast believed, be it done unto you. Now, I love that because it's so many, and I can get the exact number, I have to count them before, but in the book of Jesus' miracles, he stops and brings their attention to the fact that today he is responding to somebody's faith. Why did he do that? And then record it for you and I to read. So I would have some sermon material. Or did he do it because that was the truth he wanted to learn? The answer to Galatians 3, verse 5, that he who works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law? Or by the hearing of faith? He wanted us to be sure we had the answer. He wanted us to be sure that we understood the answer to that question. I don't have to guess. I don't have to wonder. I don't have to speculate. I mean, Jesus responded to faith. One of my favorite ones was the, the blind man who was crying out to him when he was walking by. Son of David! Son of David! Son of David! What I liked about it was everybody around him said, shut up! Leave him alone! That's the master! That's Jesus! Son of David! Son of David! Son of David! Jesus stopped. 
to kill him. And the blind man came out. And then Jesus simply asked him, what would you like? He said, well, I'd like to see. Do you believe that I can do this? And he healed him again. Jesus stopped in his tracks for faith, healed a blind man, and recorded it for you and I to know that it was done by faith. Now, you may come up with all kinds of thoughts and speculations and ideas you want, but you're not debating with me, you're debating with the Word of God. Because Jesus recorded that numerous times. Well, that just kind of throws all that religious stuff out the window, doesn't it? And brings it right back down to faith in Christ and Him crucified. The liberty that I'm talking about, we walk out by faith. And the moment we try to earn it and do it by self-effort, we defeat ourselves and try to do it by the flesh. As we get into this chapter, we're going to see in the end part of this chapter the final results of the works of the flesh. Guaranteed. No good things ever come from the effort of human flesh. Hallelujah. A lot of good things have been tried. With me so far? Falling out, have we? So, back to the idea. Jesus proclaimed Liberty for the captives. Jesus preached liberty for the captives. Jesus paid the price for the liberty of the captives. We understand that that liberty comes through the hearing of faith and not the works of the law. So why did Jesus proclaim it and preach it? Romans 10, 17 says what? Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And we, by faith in Christ and him crucified, walk out that liberty. And to stand fast in that liberty that Christ purchased for us, we have to walk it out by faith and not by the works of the law. And that's not always easy to do for any of us, is it? We like to do stuff our own. We're independent people, like right? We like to do it our way. I can handle this one, God. We may not tell him that, but our actions make that statement sometimes, don't we? Hallelujah! I want to talk for just a second. About the hearing of faith. You see, you'll find when Jesus ministered that there's a pattern in it. <coughs> Jesus preached and then he healed. And he cast out demons. Jesus preached and then he healed. And he cast out demons. Jesus preached and then he healed. And cast out demons. Jesus preached and then he healed and cast out demons. You see, when he was ministering to a body of people, you will find he preached to them. You will find he taught them. You will find he proclaimed the word to them. Why? Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The lady with the issue of blood, first thing we know, she heard about Jesus. She heard the report. She heard the message. She heard the truth. And that's still the same, isn't it? There was a person in Acts chapter 14 when Paul was preaching and says, sit there and heard Paul preach. And Paul looked at them and perceived they had faith to be healed. And this person was laying from their mama's womb. Paul said, rise up and walk. Same thing Jesus did. Preached. And then a healing was manifest. 
preached, and deliverance was manifest. You see, that simple little process of the hearing of faith that I talked about earlier, and I said that when a person is born again by faith in Christ and him crucified, I said at that point in time, you know everything you need to know about receiving anything from God ever. Because it never changes. We were born again by the hearing of faith. I have shared my example many times. And I'm not going to go into details, but you know, there was a time in my life in Southern California where everywhere I went, somebody told me about Jesus. I mean, just, you know, you know, I couldn't walk out the house without somebody stopping me on the street corner and telling me about Jesus. And I still, boy, they just impacted me. I remember a, a, a lady that, if you, I don't know if you this, lady looked just like Angela Davis standing on the corner of Hollywood Park preaching about the second coming to Christ. Holy Spirit just, whoo, walked me into that. I couldn't turn away from it. I remember a guy telling me that standing on, I sit on the beach, guy says, do you like the stars and the ocean? Yeah, I do. Well, you know, you can know the person who created him and walked away from me. One person driving down the street said, hey, God told me he loves you. That's nice. Tell him I love him too. You know, just <coughs> random stuff like that that I realized now God was speaking to me. People picked me up, took me back in a cabin in the mountains, and, and, and they had this, all these tables out in this great big huge feast. Of, of, it was like JoJo's house, all these different Mexican foods and stuff. And, and said, help yourself. And after I'm done, they talked me over and told me about Jesus. I told this all before, hitchhiking in Riverside, California. Some guy dropped me off hitchhiking, handed me a Bible, says, if I give you this, will you read it? Oh, sure, be polite. Took me two days to get a ride. God totally set me up. I had nothing to do with there. Said, by the way, you say, read that Bible. What was happening in my life? Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Without realizing it, people were giving me the word of God every time I turned around. I always said that I've been my grandma was back, and I'm like praying, God, please watch over that fool until he gets it right. Keep him alive, God, please. Keep him alive. My sister knows I'm not kidding. That was her prayer, wasn't it? Keep the fool alive. But I just kept hearing the word of God. I came back to Illinois, and, and right there, short after that, the, the, the Holy Spirit just kept bringing those scriptures up to me. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And I heard that a thousand times in my inside of me. Romans 10, 13. Why? Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And so that's how I came to Christ. And then a little bit later, it's, I, I started hearing about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And, and I had people in my life who were saying, oh, 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 that's the better. Stay away from that mess. I had other people tell me, well, you ain't got all of God until you get a hold of that. I mean, I had both sides, and they were very, very adamant, very fervent, telling me, you know, you go either way. So I got into God's Word, and I began to study it. And I began to dig into it. I didn't begin to listen to what this group said or that group said. I looked into what the Word said. And as I'm reading the Word, guess what's happening? Faith coming by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. I'm reading about the baptism of the Holy Spirit one day, driving down Interstate 74 in the backseat of the car. Boom! God baptized me in the Holy Ghost. What happened? Faith coming by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. By the hearing of faith, I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit the same way I was born again. And I can take you down the list of everything in my life I've ever received from God. I can assure you happened the exact same way by the hearing of faith. I began to hear the word of God, and the next thing you know, I got faith, and I believed that God manifested. And if you go down to your life, you'll find out that everything you received from God came the same way. Now, you may have tried a million other ways and not received, but the times you received, that's how it happened in your life. I mean, I'll confess, I've tried other stuff. But I eventually got to the point where I realized, you know what, well, what the Word says is true. I'm just going to believe the Word. And those times that I tried to be holy enough, it didn't work. If I fast 21 days in a row, I know how to do this. But it's great to fast, but that's not how you receive from God. You don't earn it that way. It's still by the hearing of faith. Now, the fasting and listening to God is going to help you. Get you in line in some areas. Well, I don't know if I just carry a cross for 100 miles. I mean, people come up with all kinds of ideas. And I'm not making fun of people because I've been through those things. I've been in those areas where I've tried to do it and, and, and not realizing it had fallen prey to trying to do it by my efforts. 
words and my strength and, and my way. Sometimes my flesh is getting one of those. You guys know, have never had those issues, y'all. Super Saints never dealt, dealt with any of those battles, but I'm just sharing your mind battles so you can help somebody else over a long time that might be struggling too. But you see, it's so easy. Like I shared this morning, that's what's happening in the book of Galatia. They're trying, the enemy is trying to take that church and get their mind off of the simplicity of the gospel. The hearing of faith. My salvation. My deliverance. The fullness of the Holy Spirit was demonstrated in us to the word of God when Moses tapped the rock and the water would come out abundantly. And we find out later in the New Testament that rock was Jesus. You see, it was so plainly laid before us. Amen? You with me so far? Go to Romans chapter 8. Shifting gears one more time. I'm about that. Don't get nervous. You know what? Let's skip on chapter 8. Let's go back to Galatians 5. Seriously. Now, here's one of those scriptures that you very rarely hear taught. And you very rarely hear mentioned when you're talking about faith. And I remember years and years ago preaching a sermon on this verse. And it was just an, an old, <coughs> like, National Guard Armory building that I was in preaching in, I don't know too much about it, really a long time ago. But I remember very specifically the Lord put this verse on my heart and preached that day. And I remember the response of some of the people. I mean, they were just really kind of flabbergasted by this verse. And I thought, you know, I, I don't guess I remember I probably preached this verse one time in my whole life, and that was that day at that army. And I don't think I've ever heard anybody else really mention as much. Galatians chapter 5, verse number 6. For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. Faith which worketh by love. That word worketh there is very interesting. That word needs to be activated, effectual, to work effectively and operative. Faith, to put it in more understandable terms for you and I, faith which is energized by love. Now here he's talking about the hearing of faith and, and how we live for God and, and how we walk with God and learning how to do that. And now he's bringing our attention to the fact that faith is energized by love. Because you see where we're going at, he's going to tell us something here. And just a little bit, he's going to tell us that the reason we're liberated is to love one another. The reason we're liberated is to serve one another. The reason we're liberated is to serve God. We are set free from every bondage and manageable by faith in Christ and crucified so without restraint we can serve God and love one another. But here he says faith is energized by love. And you don't ever hear this talk much. And as a matter of fact, is that there are certain scriptures like this that if you was to do a little bit of digging, you'd find that you'll find that you're not going to hear a lot of people teach on it or find a lot of things written on it. You can go back in the old commentaries and, and there are certain verses they just seem to kind of skip over. And this is one of them that they don't mention a lot. So how is faith energized by love? Well, let me give you a couple ideas. Imagine two people tell you something. And they're exactly contradicting one another. And one of them is somebody who is a total stranger to you. You've never seen them before. The other one is your mama. Who's loved you all her life? Which one are you going to believe? Hopefully, your mama. In other words, when you're convinced, and I, and I know this from, 
from life, I know this very much as a pastor. And, and this is something as a pastor you learn over the years. When you understand that I have only your best interest at, at heart, then I can tell you almost anything. But if you don't know that, you're not going to hear it. See, there's people I've pastored for years now and, and been through the ups and downs and all the rounds and and if I have to come to them and, and correct them on something or bring something to their attention, they're very receptive of it. Because they've seen through the years that I just want them to do well enough. And I'm just concerned about their walk with God. So, love breeds trust. Love energizes faith. And when you know somebody loves you, it's much easier to believe them. So when you apply that same line of thought to God, when you understand, truly understand it, and I'm going to get you another scripture here in a moment, when you truly understand that God loves you, that it's not just a religious <coughs> phrase you say, it's not just something that you say because you've heard it every Christmas, but you truly understand in the depths of your being that God loves you, then it should be very easy to believe. When you have doubts about the character of God, then you're going to battle with your faith. You're going to battle with your trust in God. And, and I know we don't like to think that way or, or talk that way, and, and that's not the religious way to say it. Say, well, I just have a struggle with God because I end up nervous about His character. But a lot of people have things in their life that they trouble, struggle, with the fact that God loves them. Maybe they just have a couple of in life. Maybe they just haven't really been touched by the depths of the Holy Spirit in their being and that God loves them. And I want to share this story, and I don't know why there's just certain things in life that will just have an imprint upon them. And sometimes with me, it, 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 I've had experiences with God standing up and just simply talking or, or preaching or teaching. Sometimes God's given me understanding and revelation of things as I'm standing here talking. And I remember one time years ago, and you probably I brought this to your attention before, and I was given my testimony. And it was at a, a church in Peoria. There was me, Richard Pryor's son, and one other lady. And we were all given our testimony to what was called a shackle. And it was a, a group of people who come out of drugs and alcohol, that type of thing. And it was a convention or whatever. And I was standing there talking. And, and the thing that God really put upon my heart to talk to them about was just knowing that God loves you. And as I was standing there talking about it, it was almost overwhelming when the Spirit of God just came alive on the inside of me. And, and, I, and I, I knew God loved me, but at that moment in time, for some reason, it became so powerful that God loved me. And I shared with them the experience of knowing that God loves you or me. And really understanding not just a, a, a term of God so loved the world, but God loved me. God loved you. And when you experience the reality of that, how could you not believe him? You see, it shouldn't be too hard to trust God if you understand his love for you. See, the prodigal son didn't grasp that. You know, we use the prodigal son as a, 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 a message of teaching, especially in, you know, evangelistic type of messages. And, and, and it's great for that. But the prodigal son didn't understand that God loved him. When I was wondering what happened, why did the prodigal son wander off? And, and I think the prodigal son was looking for love in all the wrong places. See, how do you know that? Because when he got ready to go back home, he didn't know that his father loved him. So he went out, he took his inheritance, he spent it all on riotous living, he spent it all on partying and, and doing his thing, but when it was all said and done, he basically comes to his senses in his hog pit, he says, wait a second, my father's servant was this good, I'm going to go back to my father and see if he will let me be a servant. Now you don't go back to a loving father and say, can I be your servant? He didn't understand his father's love. He got up and he went back and he said to his father and he didn't even get the words out of his mouth. His father was watching for him. And his father runs and embraces. 
embraces him and welcomes him back. And the idea of being a servant never crossed his mind. He said, get the best robe, get the rings, get the vine shoes out here, get that fatty calf and kill him. We're going to have a great celebration. My son who was lost is now found. He was dead, but now he lives. And he welcomed him back. The son didn't understand the love of the father, or else he wouldn't have been asking to be a slave. He would have just said, I'm going home. I hope my, my kids are not going to say, Dad, can I be your servant? <laughs> wow! <laughs> I would be offended if my kids didn't understand my love better than to want to be my servant that something's wrong <clears throat> you see faith is energized by the reality of God's love for us go to Ephesians chapter 3 Hallelujah. Imagine almost done. Only got five more scriptures now. This is what I said. Hallelujah. There's a couple of things in the book of Ephesians that the Apostle Paul prayed for. For those who were in Ephesus in that church. In the first part of the book of Ephesians, in chapter 1, he prays that they would get a revelation and an understanding of the power and the authority they have as a result of Christ being exalted to be on the right hand of the Father. Here in this chapter, and in these verses, he's praying for them that they will give, have an experience of the love of God. Not that we'll know it in an abstract way, but they will actually have an experience of the love that God has for them. Ephesians chapter 3, let me read that to you. Verse 17. Remember, he's already stated that he's praying that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that you be rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. To know the love of Christ is a Greek word that is better put in our terms that you will experience the love that God has for you. That you won't just know it by an idea, you won't know it by, some, by a concept, but you will have an experiential knowledge of the greatness of God's love for you. And he says that as a result of that, they will walk in the fullness of God. Faith is energized by love. We need, and I pray, that each and every one of you will have an experience of the greatness of God's love for you. Amen. And the fullness thereof. Amen. Because you know what? Then it's very easy to believe a loving God. I mean, just think about it. If some stranger comes in here and tells Nina something and then JoJo tells her the exact opposite, who's she going to believe? Why would she believe JoJo over some stranger? Because she knows the love that JoJo has for her. And she knows that JoJo would never lead her astray. You see, you can go through the Bible and find Adam and Eve didn't understand that. If Eve were to understand the love that God had for her, she wouldn't have believed the devil. She said, wait a second. No, 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 no. God said, don't eat from that tree. And I know how much God loves me. He would never lead me wrong. He would never lead me astray. Amen? Amen. Isn't that so much better than rules? Yeah. Laws. Yes. Faith that works by love. Amen. And Christ and Him crucified. Amen. Let's all just have the worship team come up here. Mm -hmm.